Now, graduation at convocation is a very special time. It's very special, first and foremost, because of you. But it's also special because universities bring very special people to graduate with you or to be honored with you on this day. UBC has the honor of bestowing honorary degrees to very small number of select individuals who, in the opinion of the university community, have fit the criteria of excellence and eminence in their chosen field. Lewis K exemplifies these characteristics, and I invite him now to step forward to receive his honorary degree. <laughs> Mr. Chancellor, Dr. Lewis K is widely known for his pioneering research in biochemistry and his role in developing modern nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. After completing his Bachelor of Science degree at the University of Alberta, he went on to obtain his PhD in molecular biophysics from Yale University in New Haven in 1988, followed by postdoctoral studies at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda. He returned to Canada in 1990 to accept a faculty position at the University of Toronto where today he is a professor of molecular genetics, biochemistry, and chemistry, and a senior scientist in a molecular medicine program in Toronto's Hospital for Sick Children. His methods allow researchers to see how the shapes of molecules change over time, which has provided new insight into protein structure and function that are closely tied to human health and disease. It is essential to note that his open source approach to research has allowed hundreds of scientists, both in academia and industry, to use these methods developed by his team. Not surprisingly, his scientific papers are amongst the most highly cited in chemistry. His numerous awards include the Stacey Prize from the National Research Council of Canada and the Favelle Medal from the Royal Society of Canada. A member of both the Royal Society of Canada and the Royal Society of London, he was recently named a Canada Gairdner International Award Laureate and is a Gerhard Herzberg Gold Medalist. He's a recipient in science and engineering as well as an officer of the Order of Canada. Mr. Chancellor, in recognition of his vast achievements and contributions to medical research, I ask you to confer the degree of Doctor of Science honoris causa upon Louis E. K. By the authority of the Okanagan Senate of this university, I confer upon you, Louis E. K., the title and degree Doctor of Science Honoris Causa. Class of 2019, please welcome your fellow graduate, Dr. K, to say a few inspirational words to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chancellor, Professor Ono, Professor Buzzard, 
trustees, faculty members, parents, family and friends, and of course the class of 2019. I stand before you today with a little bit of trepidation. It's not because I'm afraid of public speaking, nor because I'm afraid of speaking to young people. Who, I do that pretty much all the time. I tell them what they need to know to pass a test or how to solve a particular assignment problem. This situation, however, is very different. You've all passed tests and you've all solved particular assignment problems, albeit for the most part those that were solved by others before you. You are about to embark upon a journey that will chart new areas of challenge and provide you with much more difficult tests. I was once in your shoes. At my commencement at the University of Alberta some 36 years ago, I can only imagine that I too listened to some commencement speaker. If so, I remember absolutely nothing of what he or she might have said. <laughs> and the same thing happened a few years ago when I received my doctorate in, at New Haven. I don't remember that speech either. And so recognizing that you will likely not remember anything that I say, <laughs> I choose my words very carefully so that at least a few ideas might stick. Idea number one. You have just completed four years of an undergraduate education. You have mastered subject material and you soon will have a piece of paper to supposedly prove it. But the reality is that within several years, you will forget many, if not most, of the subject details that you are now fluent with. You might even forget, God forbid, how to take an integral or how to balance a chemical reaction. You will forget the nuances of a novel that, one of, that was once the basis of your best essay ever, or the economic details of some event that led to some important conflict between nations. In short, much of what you have deliberately and methodically studied in the past four years will be displaced. This begs the following question, what's the purpose of an education then? And here's the thing, an education is not about the facts that you once knew, nor all the A's that you once received on essays and tests. An education is not about the university nor your professors. An education is about you. An education gives you the ability to think. An education gives you the ability to educate and teach yourselves. An education allows you to evaluate arguments, to listen to discussions, and to formulate your own opinions based on a sense of confidence that you know that you can and that you are a valuable member of society. This is not insignificant. We live in a world that is increasingly cynical. Many of our leaders prefer intuitive responses rather than those based on scientific principles. In an era where negativity seems to be pervasive, where attacks on media are common, where somebody who looks different or prays different or believes different or thinks different is wrong, and where our leaders are increasingly anti those people who choose the thinking way, people like you are needed now more than ever. A proper education provides you with the ability to right wrongs, to think about things through on your terms, and to make proper choices based on rational thought. But with this ability comes a responsibility. You have to use your education. You have to be prepared to stand up and be counted. And importantly, you have to be prepared to put the time in to make a difference. Idea two. Can any one person really make a difference? Well, what about Fred Banting, whose work in Toronto in the 1920s led to the discovery of insulin that has saved millions of lives? It all started with a few dogs, a poorly equipped, very small laboratory, and a good idea. Banting, by the way, had several university degrees. What about the physicist Bardeen, who along with two other colleagues invented the transistor? Without these small switches and amplifiers, computers would be the sizes of large buildings. And that smartphone that no doubt some of you are staring at right now, forget it, it wouldn't exist. Bardeen also had a university degree or two. And how about Elon Musk? Musk. He has done all right with his economics and physics degrees from the University of Pennsylvania. And what about Donna Strickland? The work she did as a physics graduate student at the University of Rochester on high power pulses for lasers, won her the Nobel Prize in Physics this year 
becoming only the third woman to do so. And Donna, like you guys, did her undergraduate degree at a Canadian university. And then there's UBC's very own Michael Smith, a Nobel Prize winner who developed site-directed mutagenesis that changed the way that we look at protein molecules. So you see, you're all in very, very good company. Idea three, be who you are, not what others want from you. Every person looks at a problem uniquely and differently and has something to contribute that's unique. There's nothing wrong with being outside the Gaussian, even by a few standard deviations. That just means that you're very, very special. Who makes the real changes in the world? It's those who are comfortable in their own skin. Choose small goals and work on them to completion. Make a list of what you want to do every day, and when you're done, be happy. Solve the problems that are the most important to you. And above all, don't try to choreograph where you're going. Life is an adventure, and you want to be open-minded about what it is telling you. In my laboratory, I continue to instruct my students that the machine we use, basically a glorified MRI for imaging biological molecules, that machine never lies. And it's important to listen to what the experiments are actually telling us. This holds true in all walks of life. Everything we do is some sort of experiment. And to move on in an intelligent manner, we have to stop and we have to listen. Idea four, don't multitask. Ever tried to study for an exam and watch TV at the same time? How did that turn out? Or perhaps you prefer to search your cell phone as you engage somebody in conversation, or maybe look at your cell phone as you hear a convocation address. No, of course not you. So for your friends in the audience, let me give them a piece of advice. Psychologists have shown that when people attempt to compete, complete many tasks at once, or even when they op alternate rapidly between them, errors increase significantly, and it takes far longer, almost two times or three times more, to finish the job than if they essentially did things sequentially. Focus on the present and the task at hand. And if you're stuck, move on and then come back. And don't ever, ever give up. Some problems are really hard, and you need to continue to confront them for a long time. Trust me, when you solve the problem, it's a tremendous feeling. Idea five, take time to smell the roses. There's this amazing story about the great violinist Joshua Bell. One wintry day in January a few years ago in Washington, D.C., he played in a subway for 45 minutes and over this span collected a grand total of $30. Very few people stopped, although children were quite interested, but they were pulled away by their parents who were rushing to a particular appointment. When he packed up, there was no applause, no nothing. Think about it. One of the world's greatest musicians playing on a $3.5 million violin. That's 3.5 million US dollars. And only a few children actually stopped. If we don't have the time to truly appreciate random, amazing moments, if such things do not fit into our compact and complex schedules, then in the words of David Emery, who wrote about the story, what else are we missing in life? Always strive to retain an inner sense of curiosity like the children in the story. Take time to appreciate the finer things in life. Don't rush from home to work only to rush from work back to home a few hours later. Focus on the present and realize that what you don't finish today can wait until tomorrow. Work is very patient. It always waits for you. And besides, if you, pro if you solve all your problems today, what possibly would you do tomorrow? Idea six, start educating yourselves. Maybe for many of, many of you, it's no more professors and no more tests. Well, guess what? Sorry about that, but now you are your professor, and every day will bring fresh tests. And I suspect that for some of you, you will be much tougher on yourselves than any of your professors ever were. And the tests that you will be faced with will be much more difficult than the three-hour ordeals that you have recently completed. There is no syllabus for what you will do next, no textbook, and no tried and true path. For some of you, that sounds very scary. For others, invigorating. But remember, your education has prepared you for this future. 30 years ago, I became an assistant professor at the University of Toronto. 
I had spent most of my training developing a technique called nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy that enables scientists to peer into the inner workings of biological molecules like proteins. I was convinced that we had reached the end of technology development, that I would have to forgo my love of physics and focus merely on biological applications. But several weeks into the job, I got a new idea that led to new ways of looking at these fascinating molecules. The new ideas continue to flow some three decades later. We don't know our future, and we don't know our destiny. But with education, we can be confident that we can shape our lives for the better. And in so doing, offer an amazing gift to the world, the gift of ourselves. Focused, intelligent, caring, and supportive members of society striving to improve the world one grain of sand at a time. You are prepared, you are smart, and you are confident. Now go out and do great things. Thank you very much.